Hello, this is a video lecture about medical records. Uh, so again, your notes will probably look a little bit different than mine because I did update the notes for the Brightspace uh, and I just still have the old copies. Um, but that's okay, we'll still just go through them this way and you'll just have a little bit of extra information added into yours. Um, okay, so when we're talking about medical records, we're talking about basically the pet's file is another term for, for the medical record. So it's going to include various forms, things like, um, like physical exam form, um, maybe the micro trip form, um, the patient intake form. Uh, it's going to have various documents like blood results and um, your analysis results. Uh, it's going to have like the written file itself that has all the information uh, that when the vet seen the pet, the uh, physical exam um, summary, things like that. And as well, it will include logs specific to that animal. So like a radiology log, which records the settings that we um, take the x-rays at or the anesthetic log when we are monitoring anesthetic when a patient is in surgery. So there's lots of different things you might find inside the medical record. So it needs to include detailed written descriptions of each medical condition of the patient. Um, one thing I will just mention, actually, just to backtrack a little bit, uh, I did post um, a link with some various examples of different types of medical record forms. So you can uh, have a peek at those. They're all just blank and generic, but at least you can kind of have an idea about what the forms might look like. Uh, medical records must be easy to retrieve. Okay, so we need to be able to find what we're looking for. We need, well, first we need to be able to find the file that we're looking for quite easily. And uh, we also need to be able to find the uh, document that we're looking for within the file quite easily. So we wanna make sure our files are really organized. Uh, we need to have written documentation of medical decisions and client consents. So we talked about consent forms when we talked about ethics and legal procedures. We need to keep all of those consent forms in the file. Uh, it's absolutely important that those are in there. We should also, if you remember in there, have any refusals documented as well. Uh, so those should be in the file too. Uh, and then files we can use to provide statistical info in terms of like what procedures are doing well, what things we could focus on for improving when we're looking at things from a business standpoint. So let's talk about the specific information that needs to be included in the file. So first of all is the owner's information. That's going to be basically your kind of contact info, right? So name of the owner. You can have multiple names if there are multiple owners. So you know, if there's like a, a married couple, you could have both names on the file. I've had situations where it's like a parent and a child. Um, I've had situations where it's like two friends that are just really friendly and they have each other's names on the file. So whoever is authorized to make medical decisions, to make appointments for, to um, get information, all those names should be on the file. Um, we want the, the address, the phone numbers, the postal code, city and province, and their email address. Uh, sometimes clinics, well now especially I think a lot of clinics are getting on board with sending out emails um, or even text message reminders. So it, um, if that's going on at your clinic, you definitely want to get that information. So after the owner's info, we want the animal's info. This is often called uh, the signalment. So that includes the name of the animal, the species, so canine or feline or rabbit, guinea pig, ferret, whatever you're seeing, uh, the breed of pet, their color and markings so you get a black and white cat for instance can look a lot of different ways uh, you can have like that tuxedo black and white um, where you know they're mostly black on top but their underneath is all kind of white or you could have like more like the cow spot style where they have they're mostly white but they have black spots all over uh, there's a lot of different ways so um, make a make a note of the markings as well 
uh, the sex of the animal, so male or female, and then their reproductive status, so intact or spayed or neutered. We want their age. Not all people know the age of their animals. If you know a for sure age and you know a for sure birthday, I put the birthday in the file. If I don't know the age for sure and it's just a guess, um, I mark that it's a uh, estimate. So estimated age two years. Um, if there's a tattoo or a microchip, we want that in there. Um, I feel like vaccines and weight don't necessarily count under animal info. That's going to be part of like the exam stuff. And then other information that needs to be included. So all communications with the owner. <coughs> I don't necessarily mean phone calls like, hi, when are you open till? But I mean, anytime there's a discussion about the animal's progress, we want to make those notes in the file. Or if the owner calls with a question or something, we want to make those notes in a file. Now, if an owner calls to schedule an appointment, I don't need to make a note owner called to schedule appointment and then have the appointment below it. It's just kind of implied there. But if an owner calls with an update about the animal, I definitely want to record that in the file. Or if the owner calls and has a question or something, I document that in the file along with what I gave as the answer. Uh, clinical signs and observations. So that's going to be, um, you know, remember clinical signs we talked about are the things that we can observe about an animal that are kind of like symptoms. Uh, so things like, you know, maybe they're drooling profusely and making a strange meow sound and retching. So those would be clinical signs that they're probably nauseous. We want to include our physical exam notes and any diagnostic procedures or lab tests that happen. Uh, so diagnostic procedures could be like x-rays or ultrasounds or ECGs, uh, electrocardiograms, um, lab tests, things like blood work or a urinalysis or um, if we did a cytology, which is looking at a cell slide or if we did a histopathology where we're sending away like a lump to be tested, all those need to be included. The doctor is going to include a, a differential diagnosis, a diagnosis, what the treatment plan is, if there's any surgeries, euthanasia needs to be documented, necropsies. So necropsies are kind of like an autopsy, right? Um, but they're on an animal we're talking about, um, we call them necropsies and it's uh, like an exam after death. So necro, remember, means death um, or prognosis. Um, so the prediction about how the animal will do. We also want to include the daily observations of hospitalized pets. So every day that an animal is hospitalized, there needs to be an exam and notes written in about that pet. Any prescriptions going home are documented in the file. All forms and consents. So anything that the owner has filled out um, and any consent forms have to be in there. Um, no. Okay, well, I'm not this is a weird place to put this note, but um, medical records have to be kept up to date. We want to fill them in as soon as possible. Uh, the sooner we can fill them in, the better because we'll be able to make sure that we're not losing detail. Uh, I know some doctors are really bad for filling out their files on time. Um, they're just poor at time management. So try to be really be on them to get all their files done that day. I've worked with one doctor who would put off writing in his files and then would like two weeks later be writing in them. I'm like, can you really reliably remember what you did on this fairly routine appointment two weeks later? Like I can barely remember what happened in like Survivor last night. So I feel like um, the sooner you can fill in your, your records, the better. Um, and I feel like that goes for you as well, right? If you have a phone call with an owner, uh, go ahead and pull that file and document that communication right away. Uh, Cause if you leave it for later, you might forget. If you do leave it for later, make sure you write yourself a note so you don't forget. Uh, we want to include in the medical record any previous medical history as well. Often if a client transfers to our hospital, they will have that previous medical history um, transferred to us as well. So we'll have access to their records from a different clinic. We want to include the vaccine history because it's possible that not all the vaccines will have been done at our facility. 
if they're adopting a new pet, sometimes like the breeders will have done vaccinations. If they're from a shelter, we're going to have vaccine history from there. So we'll need to know that info as well. And then um, any estimates, uh, but remember, we don't call them estimates with the owner. We call them treatment plans. And then the owner's decision on there. So if there's some things that they declined, we'd have them decline and then initial that and otherwise sign the estimate. So there are some rules that are important to follow when we're writing in medical records. I mean, some of these rules are going to apply to paper files specifically. Um, and you'll see which ones, because <laughs> in a computer file, you obviously wouldn't need to be worried about using whiteout. <laughs> um, so in general, medical records are considered legal documents. The reason for that is if someone were to try to sue the practice for malpractice, um, those medical records now become evidence. So another really great reason to make sure everything is filled in and kept up to date is that if those if records are ever requested, you don't have to worry about, well, are these going to be complete? Because yes, they will be. They should have been filled out immediately. Uh, but anyway, medical records are legal documents. So we need to protect them as such and make sure we're treating them properly. So one thing that is important is that if you are writing in the medical file, you can only do so in black or blue ink. We don't want to use our cool pink gel pen or any kind of pencil, just black or blue ink. No red pen, nothing like that. Although that being said, I will underline pets with a red line if they are fractious animals. Fractious means they're aggressive. They want to bite me. Um, we want to uh, ha date. Okay. Um, sorry, these notes are usually my, um, I just kind of go off these notes while I'm lecturing and I'll write stuff on the board. So they're not exactly super complete here. Um, every time you include an entry in the file, you need to date it and put the initials of the author. So often um, files will even have like a section for the date. So they'll kind of look like this and you can put the date in. I'm not sure the date today, May 8th, I'm not sure. And then I'd write my note, owner call, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm going to initial it at the end. So that way we know who wrote what. Now I've had, I've had VOAs in the past and techs actually complain about having to initial, it's like two letters. I don't think it's that big a deal, but having to initial after each entry and their reasoning is, well, we all know each other's handwriting. And while that might be true within the clinic, if you have to fax those over to somebody else, they're not going to know who's who. And also if these become legal documents, we need it doc or sorry, if these become evidence, like in a case, they're all legal documents, whether they're evidence or not. Uh, but if it becomes evidence in a case, we need those initials on there so we know who wrote what. So make sure you are dating and initialing every entry. Now you cannot use correction fluid in a file. So you can't use whiteout and you can't use those whiteout tape strips either. You cannot block out anything um, in a file, even if you've made a mistake. So our next one, if you have a mistake, you correct it by making a single line through, make the correction and initial it. So let's say I'm writing a TPR uh, and I write my temperature as 39.7 degrees Celsius. And then I realize, oh shoot, that was actually the previous dog. I'm getting my numbers mixed up. I'm gonna cross it out. I'm gonna initial beside it and I'm gonna write the actual temperature. Okay, so that's how we correct an error. We do not want to do um, 39.7 degrees. Oops, I made a mistake. We do not want to do that. When you're scratching it out like that, we can't read what's underneath, right? We want to be able to read what's underneath because if it's scratched out like this, it certainly looks suspicious, right? I mean, this is a fairly innocuous example because it's just temperatures, but like if there was like a drug written in there and then I had it like really scratched off like this, it kind of makes it look like maybe we're trying to cover our tracks on a mistake. So again, if this becomes evidence in um, like a malpractice case, we want them to be able to see what's underneath our mistakes 
because we want to be transparent about what happened in the file okay so we don't want to ever like black anything out we just want to do that one line through initial it and then uh write the actual thing you were trying to write um, okay, so in the file we can use abbreviations, but we can only use standard and approved abbreviations. Our standard abbreviations are all those things that we learned way back, way back, last uh, week in, um, in our terminology course. Oh, here it is again, write in records ASAP. We want to make sure that we're not losing any details, so write in the records as soon as you possibly can. Now records have to be legible. We all know the hilarious jokes about how doctors have such messy handwriting and that often applies to vets too. Um, they are not doing themselves any favors by having really messy writing. If you have to try to decipher what they're saying, um, that leaves a lot of room for errors. So if they just have like some scribble, How are you supposed to know what that means? Did they write prednisone? Did they write prednisolone? Did they write, I don't know, some other drug that starts with P? You just don't know what that says. So they need to have legible writing and you do as well. So make sure your writing is able to be read. Um, so now every sheet, every piece of paper in that paper file has to have the patient and owner info on it to some extent. Bare minimum, I want the name, uh, sorry, pet name. I want the owner's last name. That's a bare minimum that I want on there, okay? Um, ideally, we'll have a little bit more info, pet, pet's name, owner's first and last name, uh, maybe even phone number would be good on there. Some clinics give their patients like an ID number. Uh, if that's on every page, that's good too. That's because it is possible for paper files to um, get dropped on the floor and scattered. And um, sometimes doctors have multiple files open on their desk and then they just gather everything up and put it into one. And we might have paper that is in one file that was supposed to be in a different one. So we can identify that if we have names on all the papers. So files have to be easy to retrieve and well organized. Um, so typically we file like alphabetically or numerically, uh, we want to be able to get those files quickly and then within the file it has to be, uh, organized too. Um, that's gonna, different clinics do things in different ways. I personally like a chronologically arranged file because then everything just go like with the newest on top and the oldest at the back, because then I just have to go back in time to find what I'm looking for. Some clinics like to organize like all their records in one spot, all their, or sorry, all their logs in one spot, all their um, lab work in one spot, and then have just like the paper file with the doctor's writing in one spot. I don't know. I feel like that's a little bit harder to find things in. Um, but if that's still easy to retrieve though, because you know where to find the blood results, they're in the blood results section. So you might be asking yourself, so who owns the medical records? Who owns these? Uh, so um, the, the physical copy of the medical records is the property of the practice owner in the practice, okay? So they stay with that hospital, the original copies. However, clients are entitled to the information within those records. Uh, so they're not a, entitled to the original copy, but they are entitled to a copy. So the vet is obliged to provide copies of medical records when requested. If you have a read through, I, I linked um, a frequently asked questions about medical records from, it's from the BC uh, College of Veterinarians, but I think it's a lot of this stuff still really applies to Manitoba as well. So I thought it was a good um, resource to, to link for you guys. But in there, um, there's a frequently asked question of, yeah, but what if a client owes me money? Can I withhold transfer of records. Um, so if the owner requests that you send records to a different hospital, but they owe you money, are you allowed to refuse? And the answer to that is no. The owner is legally entitled to the information in that uh, file and the clinic is not allowed to withhold that information from them. Um, they can certainly send an owner to collections or try to get money uh, another way, but they cannot hold the file hostage. Uh, and that's our next topic is transfer of records. 
so often clients need to change hospitals for whatever reason. Maybe they're moving, uh, maybe they just don't like you anymore, maybe, you know, they're sister became a vet so now they want to go see the sister whatever the circumstances are they may request uh, a transfer of records oh another reason might be that they're getting a second opinion or they're seeing a specialist so the thing about records is that they are privileged and confidential so that means that they are not allowed to be released except by court order so if the court tells us we have to because it's like you know evidence in a case or if the owner has given consent, whoops, and that is written consent. In Manitoba, we have a privacy protection law. We have to have a, a, a signed consent form to transfer records. Fortunately for owners, they don't have to come to our facility to sign it. So, you know, if I usually work in North Kildonan uh, and my client has now moved to, um, you know, the south end of the city there, like Waverly West or whatever, uh, they might want to transfer to, let's say, Bridgewater. Um, they can go into Bridgewater and have Bridgewater sign over, or sorry, they can sign a fax, or, oh my God, they can go to Bridgewater, they can sign a consent form there and Bridgewater can fax it to the other clinic. So um, as long as there's written um, a consent form, then we'll be able to transfer those records. In the case of transferring records, the original copy does not leave the clinic. Remember, the originals always stay with the practice. There's no circumstances where, um, where originals leave a clinic. Uh, so the client signs the release form. That release form is then added into the medical record and the whole thing is sent over, um, where, here, either by fax Email, especially if you are a digital uh, clinic, you can e get emails or you could photocopy and send those papers either with the client or just mail them to the clinic. I have had clients that are moving out of town and they don't know where they're gonna end up. So they just request to take a photocopied package of the file and that's acceptable, we'll do that for them. Although sometimes in that case, clinics might charge a fee depending on the size of the file. If it's like five pages, whatever, but I, I have a client that um, goes to Florida every year for the winter and they always want to bring their files with them, but their files are huge because they have so many pets and they all have so many health issues that it takes up like two file folders. It's like this thick. It's huge. So I'm like, we're, we couldn't photocopy something like that and not charge you. It's like a whole ream of paper. Um, so, uh, if they have x-rays on file, uh, digital x-rays, we're going to email, um, usually. You could also send them via USB or on a CD, but email is usually really quick and easy. If they have hard copy x-rays, um, we might just have to borrow those to the clinic if they need to see them and then uh, have them returned to us. Real talk though, it's probably pretty soon that most clinics aren't even going to have like original copies of physical x-rays because I think most clinics have moved to digital. So we'll, we, I don't think that'll really come up that much for you. Uh, and then if ever a client is being referred to a specialist, a copy of the record should be sent. Now, when we talk about transferring records for like a specialist visit, typically I'm not going to transfer the entire file. I'm just going to send everything that's pertinent to this uh, situation. So if you have like a 12 year old dog that has cataracts and you're referring them to the ophthalmologist, the, they don't really need to see their puppy vaccine visits. It's just too much to send. They're not even going to look at it. So I would just send the most recent stuff um, just to give them kind of a picture of their, their most recent health. But yeah, nobody really cares about puppy visits when you're like 12 years old. So storage of records. We have to keep records for uh, five to seven years. This is a range from your textbook in Manitoba. It is seven years. So for seven years, we need to keep those files on hand. Um, so even if the animal is deceased, we need to keep that file for seven years beyond that animal's death. Uh, if the owner says, I'm never coming back here again, you're a terrible clinic and I hate you. We still hang on to those records for seven years past that point. 
Um, we always keep them for the seven years mandated by the MVMA. Uh, and that's because sometimes things come up. Maybe seven, you know, six years down the line, someone decides to sue you uh, about the loss of their dog or something. So we need to keep those records for that reason. Uh, anything beyond seven years, we can get rid of. If we are getting rid of records, um, they need to be shredded. So I don't think I have that in the notes. I don't remember if I added it into yours, but when it's past those seven years and it's time for disposal, they need to be shredded. That's because they contain confidential information. Uh, so they need to be destroyed in some way. You could also just burn them. I'd, my, <laughs> I don't know. The last practice I worked at, the owner would joke that he, he it's like, I'd be like, here's all the files to get rid of. Cause he said he'd take them to like a shredding place but then sometimes he joked that he was gonna have a bonfire so I'm not sure if he actually did and burned them or what but they just have to be destroyed uh, we don't want anyone's confidential information getting released out into the wild so th those records also include x-rays and like blood results all that needs to be retained as well um, before that seven year point though, we don't have to have every single file into our active filing system, okay? Our active filing system just has to have our active files. So we do not need to keep that dog that died six years ago. We don't need to keep that file up front and in our main filing system. Uh, we don't need to keep those clients that say they're never coming back or ones that transferred their records. We don't have to keep those in our active files. We can have an inactive area um, and we can take files from our main filing system and move them to storage. Uh, so that process is called purging, where we're getting rid of inactive files. So we just put them into a storage area. I usually label them then, you know, um, dispose in 2027. And then we know that seven years from now we could shred these, but as of right now, they need to hang around until then. Um, some people keep those inactive files uh, on hand in clinic and I think that's a good idea because sometimes clients uh, haven't come around for a long time or they say they're never coming back and then all of a sudden they're back. So it's a good idea to keep those inactive ones around just in case. Um, but other ones, like I know uh, <laughs> My, again, former uh, practice owner j had like just a big storage area in his house where he kept old files. He was kind of a hoarder though. Um, okay, so I think, I think I changed the order in yours if I remember correctly. And after that storage, I started talking about um, file systems. So I'm gonna do that. Um, I'm pretty sure that's how I laid it out. So I just wanna make sure uh, I'm kind of going in the same order as you guys. Uh, so for filing systems, we have two main methods, numerical and alphabetical. Uh, so numerical usually is um, that we've si uh, assigned a number to the client and then they are filed by number. So that's a good way to do it because it gives the owner a little bit more confidentiality. So if someone you know, broke into the clinic with the intent of stealing a pet's file, they wouldn't be able to readily find it. The bad thing though about using a number system is that you have to take an extra step before you go pull a file. So if you use an alphabetical system and the owner tells you, hi, my name is John Smith, can you please pull out my file? You can go right to the S's and find John Smith and pull it out. Um, if, you, if you have a numerical system, John, you have to look it up like in your logbook or your computer system to find out what number is assigned to John Smith. So numerical just gives you an extra step and is sometimes uh, a bit more difficult to find um, what you're looking for then. Um, so every place I've ever worked has used alphabetical because I think it's just a little bit easier. So I did give you guys a non-graded practice assignment to practice putting names into alphabetical order. So in there, there is a link to the rules of filing um, and how to approach kind of those weird names like the O apostrophe, like O'Neill, or um, like the Mick and the Max and all those. So you can have a look at that those rules to see about filing. I included this as a practice assignment because um, it was shocking to me working in clinic how many VOAs would come in 
for their practicums and have no idea how to put things in alphabetical order. So that practice assignment is to give you uh, a little rundown on that. And I will warn you that on the test, there is a section where you will be alphabetizing some names. So good idea to have some practice there. Uh, and then typically every animal is gonna have their own file or there'll be like a client file with individual pets inside the client file. So um, it just depends on how your practice um, likes to organize those. And then I have a little note here that color coding can increase filing efficiency by 90%. And I gave you a couple photo examples in your notes. Um, and you can see why I think that it increases that filing efficiency. So you can see right away if you've made a filing mistake because there it's, you can see those long strips of colors. If all of a sudden it's like you, it's all blue and there's a pink in there, you can see that someone made a mistake. So it's a lot easier to find um, errors with color coding. We'll also use color coded stickers for the year. So we'll put a sticker on the last time we saw the animal. Um, and then if I'm looking to purge files, I can pull out inactive ones. So if I haven't seen a client in like five years, I don't need to keep that file in my main filing system. So I can just look at all the colors, let's say five years ago, 2015 let's say was red all I have to do is look for red stickers and pull those out um, okay so let's talk about paper records so some clinics now are paper some clinics use digital records or um, computerized records so there's kind of pros and cons to both um, so paper records are going to be in a file folder often Clinics will use ones that have these, um, oh, this is supposed to say two hole fastener, uh, a two hole fastener. So um, I have picture, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna like trying to demonstrate it with my hands. That's silly. I included pictures in your note package. So you'll be able to have a look at those two hole fastener um, uh, file folders. Sometimes um, I've worked at quite a few clinics that don't bother with those uh, fasteners at all and it's just a regular file folder. So I included their pictures for you of different filing items uh, so that you have an idea about the different kind of equipment that we use for filing with paper files. So I included the color coding stickers, name label stickers. If you don't know how to make labels with Word documents, maybe let me know, I can show you guys. Because um, we'll usually make printed labels to stick on, on files. Um, what else did I include in there? And then the files itself, the file holder I included. Um, typically paper records are gonna be on eight and a half by 11 inch paper, which is just your standard computer paper. Uh, so computerized records, the, um, they're also called paperless records. Uh, they can be accessed from any, uh, hold on. Okay, never mind. I thought this is, Never mind. Um, can be accessed from any computer in the clinic. So that's handy, right? Um, if you have a paper file, you can only access it by looking at the paper file. So it's kind of nice to be able to access it from anywhere. There are some um, cl uh, clinic software as well where you can even access it on your phones. So if you do have computerized system, typically your lab machines integrate with that. So if that is the case, then as soon as your blood work is completed, it sends it directly into the file. So there's way less chance of uh, things going missing in between. If it doesn't do that though, you have to scan those blood work into the file. Digital x-rays, same way. Those guys just go right into the file. It's really cool. But with computerized records, you need to make sure that you're backing them up daily and monthly and preferably off-site. Uh, ideally, it's nice to have like a physical backup in your clinic, in your safe. Uh, and then um, it's not a bad idea to like if you can cloud backup too. That's kind of a nice thing to be able to do as well because it's off site too. Uh, so there are some advantages to computerized medical records. And a lot of these advantages, um, if you flip them, it's, it, it's a disadvantage of the paper records, okay? So advantage of computerized, it's easy to capture missing charges um, because you have to enter everything into the computer in order to do it. So I have to enter the blood work into the computer to be able to run blood work and then the blood work automatically goes into the file. So there's nothing missing. Um, with paper files, uh, the doctor could orally tell me to run blood work. I would go and run the blood work and it doesn't log anything into the file. And then the blood work prints 
and then the doctor looks at it and then leaves it on his desk and doesn't put it into the file and then no one knows we did blood work and we don't charge them for it. So it's easy to miss charges with paper records. So it's easy to access the records at any computer. The flip side of that, paper records are crap at accessing at different areas. You can only look at them uh, in the file itself. With computerized records, you can easily target specific clients if you're doing a marketing, um, I can't think of the word here, a marketing plan, I guess, I'm not sure. Um, but if you have, um, let's say you're, you're wanting to send out um, something for patients that are uh, overdue on rabies, let's say. Uh, if you have computerized medical records, it's really easy to identify what patients are overdue on rabies. Computer records also take less time to enter the information um, because it's way easier to type. It's way faster than sitting and handwriting out all your notes. Uh, an advantage of computerized records is you can always read them. Doesn't matter how messy your doctor's writing is if, it, if they're typing, right? And again, on the flip side of that, a disadvantage of paper records is they're sometimes hard to read. And if you spill your coffee on them, they're kind of wrecked. If you have computerized records, the client often perceives that as progressive or higher quality medicine and people like to think that everything's state of the art. So if something's digital, it feels so technological, right? And people are into that. I've been to my doctor, well, my former doctor, I have a different doctor now, but like um, my former doctor had like a, um, like a dictating device he would talk into and it would just convert directly into typing on the computer. That, that looks pretty high end, right? Uh, and then computer systems and computer files take up way less space. It just takes up the computer um, and like your, your backup and like, I don't know if you need a server or something. Your paper records will often fill an entire wall in your reception area. So paper files take up way more room. Not to mention all your purged files, which are in your storage unit. So it uh, definitely takes up less space to have computerized files. And now eco-friendly, eco I'm gonna pop a question mark on because I don't know on this one. Um, I suppose it's eco-friendly because you're not printing off tons of paper, but is it eco-friendly because it takes a ton of energy to run all the servers and like do all the backups and all that stuff for, um, for computerized records. So I'm popping a question mark on there I need to see a cost benefit analysis on the uh, energy usage on that personally, but, uh, but technically more eco-friendly because you're not wasting as much paper. Uh, so now let's talk about disadvantages of paper rec or sorry, computerized records. Uh, so it is possible that your server crashes and you don't have your records anymore. That would be terrible. That's why you need to have backups happening regularly so that you don't lose any of your records. Um, y y there's no possibility of a server crashing with paper records. So you're a hundred percent safe from a server crash with paper records. Um, also, we I'm sure know that data is not uncorruptible, right? It is possible that there's some kind of corruption that, that results in the loss or change of records. And that is not ideal. Um, again, though, if you are backing up regularly, you can avoid a major loss, right? You might lose maybe the stuff that you did today, but you might not lose everything that's older, which is a good thing. And again, no risk of that with paper records. Uh, a disadvantage of computer records is sometimes they lack medical details. And I would say, I think lots of doctors are really bad for not remembering to write in their files. And then um, if they have the paper file sitting on their desk as a reminder, they'll be like, oh, right. And they'll go back in and they'll write notes. But if they don't, they, it just get, gets lost in the ether, right? If you have a computerized file. So you might end up with stuff that isn't complete in the, in the medical records, which, isn't, which is a bad thing. That's a bad thing in a, in a medical record. Because remember, we want to make sure that we're filling them in as soon as possible so that they're fully complete. So paper records, I do think, are a little bit better for that. Um, okay, moving on. So there are uh, medical record violations and I have a list here of some of the ones that are the most common. Um, 
So, a uh, euthanasia without consent. We absolutely always need a consent form for euthanasia. And you might be like, well, wait, how do you not have an owner's consent and then euthanize an animal? Because if you don't remember, euthanasia is like we're ending that pet's life, right? Uh, so I'm not talking about that we just decided to go ahead with euthanasia and didn't consult with the owner. That obviously would be super illegal. Uh, what happens sometimes is that, well, let's say we're doing a surgery and the doctor, uh, it's like an exploratory, the doctor opens the patient up and it turns out that their entire belly is just full of cancer. Often the doctor then will call the owner, let them know what they found, and uh, a lot of the time the owner elects to have the animal euthanized on the table. So we do not wake them up from anesthetic. We give them um, the, or the uh, euthanol drug and then they pass away without having woken up from anesthetic. Um, that's like often just the le less cruel thing to do. They don't have to recover from the surgery then for the owner to come in and be present to euthanize. So often that is what they will elect. Um, so it is possible then that uh, that euthanasia consent form might get missed. Uh, but we need to make sure we always have that consent form in the file regardless of the situation. Or like sometimes it'll be a hospitalized patient um, and then we do a euthanasia on, on, on the pet because they're not doing better. Uh, but anytime we do a euthanasia, we need the consent form in there. I think lots of doctors are bad for this one. Medical records that state routine. But the big question is, what is routine? Routine to who? Uh, lots of people write routine cat spay or feline spay but there are multiple different ways to do a cat spay or not cat spay i was thinking neuter is what i meant to say um so we don't want to just state routine we want to talk about what we did all, all the time um doctors either not write just not writing in their physical exam there always has to be a physical exam uh, if a client refuses something, we need to have it documented in the record. Doctor recommended blah, blah, blah. Client refused. Uh, and again, that's because if the owner comes back and tries to claim malpractice, well, you should have told me. You can be like, I did. You declined. It's in the file. Uh, and then legibility. Illegible records equals a possible increase in error. We need to make sure that we can read those records. Uh, okay, and then I'm just going to backtrack now to how we organize our records. And I did give you guys a couple examples of these two, like photo examples in your uh, note package. So make sure you have a look at those. So how we organize them typically, uh, I think most commonly in vet practice is the POMR, which stands for Problem Oriented Medical Records. So this is a format that provides a complete, accurate, and detailed account of the patient. It gives us lots of information. It's the most commonly used format in veterinary medicine. So let's talk about the different sections that are going to be in a POMR. Often there is a master problem list. Again, we'll have a look at those um, form examples to see an example of a master problem list. There should be a comprehensive history of the animal. It'll include physical exams. There'll be a database of the basic info, so like that owner info, the pet signalment. It'll have all the lab results, the medical procedures that are done, um, same with uh, surgeries in there, and then progress notes on how the animal is doing. So these records are kept in chronological order, which is the way I like to see records. And then all those progress notes, those are like visits, right? Whenever the animal's in for a visit. Those are gonna be divided into four sections. And there's an acronym to remember those sections and that acronym is SOAP. SOAP stands for Subjective, Objective, Assessment of the Problem, and then Procedure or Plan of Action. So P is Procedure or Plan. So let's talk about that SOAP format. So S stands for Subjective. Subjective means that it could look different to different people. So uh, a subjective observation um, might be, um, I don't know, oh, this is a good one. Uh, animals um, size, right? So uh, I know I had a cat that was a really great healthy weight, like perfectly healthy weight. And, um, and one of my husband's friends came over and he was like, oh my God, you need to feed your cat, it is so skinny. I was like, what? 
So he's used to just like hugely obese cats. So this regular healthy sized cat looks really thin and scrawny to him, okay? So that's a, that's a good subjective thing, right? Uh, an example of subjective. So the things that are subjective are things that are not measurable, okay? Um, so this is gonna include the reason for the office visit, so why they're coming in. Uh, it's gonna include the patient history and the observations made by the client. So basically the subjective is all the stuff the client tells us. It's based entirely on opinions and perceptions, usually by the owner. When we move on to the objective, something that is objective means that, um, you know, you it's like measurable. So um, you and I might look at the same animal and say that the animal is, um, I might say it's fat, you might say it's skinny, but we would both weigh it and know that it's 10 pounds. Okay, so an objective is something that's measurable. So it includes factual measurable data, things like the body temperature, any diagnostic workups or interpretations. Uh, so that's gonna be, um, you're gonna see things in the objective like the, uh, the physical exam, the TPR, um, the temperature pulse respiration, right? Uh, you're gonna see blood results. You're gonna see uh, UA, et cetera. So it's all the, uh, basically the tests and the number things that we can see. And then we're gonna see the assessment. Oh, I just need my next piece of paper. So the assessment is going to include the conclusions reached from the combination of that history and then the physical exam and the lab work. This is where the doctor is gonna provide that definitive diagnosis. So we talked about a differential diagnosis. That's all the things the doctor thinks it might be. The definitive diagnosis is what it is. And then lastly, the plan, that's gonna include everything that we're gonna do to treat the animal. So it's gonna include treatments. So like nail trims, um, express the anal glands, put on a bandage, clip and clean, etc. It's gonna include surgeries. So uh, a lump removal or a spay surgery or I don't know, a TPLO. Um, it's gonna include any medications, so prescriptions or over the counter, either way. It's gonna include intended future diagnostics. So let's say the animal was diagnosed with um, hyperthyroidism. Uh, at this visit, we did the thyroid test. The doctor sends home some medications and wants to retest the thyroid in three months. That's an intended future diagnostic. It also includes intended future communications with the owner. So um, call the owner for a care call uh, in two weeks, that kind of thing. Uh, it would also include like rechecks is all part of the plan. Okay, so I think we've gone over, yes, we've gone over all the stuff for medical records. So you can consult with your um, notes because they're a little bit more thorough than mine, but hopefully I've given you a little bit of an overview of the medical records. Uh, I did include other information and examples for you on Brightspace, so make sure you do have a look at those to uh, get the best picture about medical records that you can. Uh, if you do have any questions from this section, make sure that you do ask them in the virtual classroom, in the chat, or you can send me an email. Uh, thank you so much for listening to this video lecture about medical records, and we'll see you in the virtual classroom. Bye!